Hi, everybody. I am John Taylor. Um, I'm excited to be back here for another week of uh, Rock and Relationships, where we talk about skills that um, are largely developed in individual recovery, whether you are an addict or a, a partner of an addict or love someone who's addicted. Um, that we develop in our individual recovery and healing that are great to bring to our relationships. Um, and um, I, I came to this work because I'm a clinical social worker. I'm a therapist outside of Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, most of the work I do is with um, addicts and um, their partners. I do a lot of marital work. And um, one of the things that I've noticed in the recovery community is I, I think on both sides, both the addict and the partner, um, I think they are held back way too long um, from engaging in their relationship in organic, meaningful ways and, and gathering the data there. And um, I think people do better in recovery when they get to be engaged in relationships that are important to them. So hopefully you can take a bit of what we talk about today and you can engage in a relationship that's important to you. Often I'll speak from the perspective of your romantic or committed relationship, but these skills are useful everywhere whether that's as a parent, um, as an employee, as a boss, as a member of a, any number of communities. So today we are going to talk about emotional disengagement and loneliness, um, which is a critical, it, it's a critical dynamic um, to understand and to rework if it's going on in your relationship. So we're gonna start with a question. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, if our participants could, I might just reflect on this question and maybe put in the chat um, some of your thoughts around this. What are some of the ways that people signal their interest in connecting some way in a relationship? So whether that's a romantic signal, whether that's a, I just wanna spend time with you or I'm interested in who you are, what are some of the ways you see people signaling their interest to connect? And put your thoughts in the chat and we will discuss a bit. So somebody said you ask about their day. Um, that actually is one of the most basic and one of the most effective ways to engage and to show interest in any relationship knowing what goes on in the course of that person's day um, from, from the research that John and Julie Gottman have done. Um, that is actually so impactful. It's one of their seven suggestions for making a relationship work, moving from a relationship disaster to a relationship masters. You just know what's going on in somebody's day. Um, somebody else said they actively engage, they text, they call, they email, asking questions and listening for an answer. Um, I'm noticing in both of these, the way that interest is signaled is um, not just in this, I'm interested in you, I want something from you, um, but I want you to feel something here. I want you to feel my interest. I want you to feel my engagement. Um, now take a minute and maybe think about what it feels like when you signal interest, um, whether that's really overtly or even just you know very timidly, when you signal interest and it's not, it doesn't register with the person or you can't see a change at all in their behavior, in their outlook, in their engagement in the relationship. What does that feel like to you when you signal interest and it's not, um, it's not met with interest. Somebody said, I feel rejected. Um, that is the heart of rejection. I put myself out there. Um, I, I wanted something vulnerably in our relationship space and I don't even feel like that registered with you. I feel rejected and that's a good word for it. Um, somebody else said, I feel hurt um, when that happens. Um, now think about what happens over time in a relationship where these bids for interest, these bids of connection are rejected or ignored again and again. Um, what starts to happen is we may become less willing to reach and bid, or we may become more jaded, more cynical, um, more guarded in our reaches. Um, so we may not have a lot more room for error. And this is what sets up that emotional disengagement and loneliness dynamic in a relationship. This comes from um, a lack of awareness of what the signals are for connection. Um, and 
because we're not aware of what those signals are, or maybe in some cases we don't care what the signal is from our partner. Maybe we're so overwhelmed with our own stuff or we do, we like, I think of, I think of um, workplaces I've been in where yes, I, I showed up to get the job done because that was part of my, that was part of my arrangement and part of the paycheck, but interacting with a group of people day in and day out, those basic needs I have to, you know, be noticed and, and have people take an interest in me, those aren't going to go away just because it's a professional setting. Um, so when, when we tell ourselves that those needs or, or we say that our, our partners needs, it's not the time for that. It's not what this is about. That's where that emotional disengagement and that loneliness will really set in um, because we, we believe that we are not a priority for our partner. We believe we're not a priority in the relationship. And oftentimes we come to that belief rightly. You know, it's not just an insecurity that we carry around and brought to the relationship. Behaviorally, we can tell when we're a priority and when we're not. I think the key word in that statement is A. Um, it, is, it is not a, it, it is not a, a research back verified need in a relationship that we have to be the priority. But to know that we are a priority and, and among the top priorities of our partner, that's what starts to bring that willingness to engage. Um, and that's what brings that willingness to reach out, vulnerability to signal our interest in connecting. Um, when, this, when we're in emotional disengagement and loneliness, that whole system of turning towards that we talked about a few weeks ago, um, that system isn't working at all. Um, this is... Um, in, in many cases, um, this is a really good indicator that if there's a lot of an emotional disengagement and loneliness going on, this is a good indicator that we may be looking for another relationship or a different relationship that can meet those needs. Um, whether that means a fair or whether that means I'm needing to kind of write my partner or my spouse off and, and make sure I get those needs met elsewhere. Um, when we're reaching out in that, like to bridge this gap, gap, it's really, really important that we're able to express what we need and also listen for the response back from our partner um, on, on both sides. Because sometimes when we express what we need, um, there's the spoken truth that comes from our partner. And that may be, you know, depending on, oh, sure, of course, I, I can give that to you. And then there's maybe no intention to follow through or there's not follow through. Um, or there's the I won't do that for you and we're really defended. It's also important to pay attention to the behavioral truth that you're getting back. Um, how do they actually act in response to this? Um, Cause I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of cases, especially with the addicts that I work with where their stated truth may be, I can't, I'm not interested, but really behaviorally they may soften and they may try to get, they may still try to get some connection. They just don't know how to be overt about it. And the waiting, the waiting for that validation of the reach or the waiting for that, did you really notice that? That's often the most distressing part for us in the reach. So it's important when a reach is made that we're able to note, hey, I can see that you want this. I can see that you're reaching. I'm not in a position to do that right now or let me get ready for that. That's a really important um, interchange to keep that disengagement and that loneliness from, from spiraling. Um, it's also important here, and this is where I see a real personal recovery skill evident, it's important here that we're able to express our positive needs. So when we're in a relationship or a setting where the overall story is I don't feel attended to and I do feel disengaged and I do feel lonely, criticism and fault finding are really, really easy. And I've talked, I've talked a lot of times before that if we want to re-engage a relationship, we have to make it as easy as possible for our partner to re-engage. So sometimes that means while I feel a lot of resentment and hurt now, what I'm going to give you initially is my desire to connect with you, not all of my hurt and resentment. I'm going to give you something that will be easier for you to pick up. And then once we've established that connection and that trust, then I may share with you what some of my enduring vulnerabilities are and some of my hurt is. Um, but initially we have to express those positive needs and in, in individual recovery, what I've noticed with the vast majority of the clients that I work with, um, identifying the no is very important. It, it's really important to know where your bottom line is and what needs to stop and what can't continue. 
However, for long-term recovery, I think identifying the yes is far more important. If we don't know what it is we need to say yes to or what we need to invite into our lives, we move into kind of this stagnant sobriety or this stagnant relationship state where all we're doing is saying no and we're not saying yes. Um, so, so the relationship is just stuck in this, well, at least we're not going here, but then it's where are we going? So expressing the positive need really is that um, we may be very aware of what we want less of, and it is important to communicate that, um, but being able to bridge the gap between the disengagement and the loneliness and the connection we want, it requires that we give some, this is what I need. I would like more time with you. Or, um, you know, I've, I've both been a supervisee and a supervisor, and I've really appreciated when my supervisees will tell me, um, I feel like I need more focused time from you because I'm not able to process what I need or I'm not getting the need met. Um, that's a much easier place to go to meet a need when I know what it is, is that's being looked for rather than just here's what's not happening. Um, you know, so being able to express our positive needs gives a chance for engagement. Um, now with all of this, of course, there's the caveat that sometimes the relationship is not in a place where this kind of repair can happen or both parties may not be interested. Um, and that's important to gauge too. Again, I'd say that's part of the behavioral truth that we're gathering. Um, and it, it's important to, um, I think it's important to interpret those signals and to take those as, as part of the equation. Because it may be that you go forward in a lot of relationships in good faith and you, you engage with some positive need and um, making your partner a priority and you may find that year after year, month after month, week after week, your partner doesn't do the same for you. And that tells a story about the relationship too. Um, but that is what I have for emotional disengagement and loneliness today. Well, I, and I was thinking, thank you uh, as always for sharing. I was thinking loneliness is one of those that it's, uh, it's so, um, I, I think of the empty void, you know, like when I'm feeling lonely and I'm, I'm fortunate I don't get that often, but when I do, I, it's a really core challenging thing. And so you're talking about the loneliness spiral and I thought, mm -hmm. wow, I could see that, you know, that, it, you know, that it, it kind of, you know, then, you, then almost like a negative lens of, well, this person's disengaged and, you know, no one else is calling me or what, you know, I mean, it's that whole thing where it just kind of feeds into itself and yeah. makes it even and um, more challenging to kind of get out of it. Um, uh, you know, I was thinking too, when you're talking about the, um, the, the positive things, you know, a few weeks ago, you talked about negotiation and, and I was thinking, oh yeah, it's like the donut of like, you know, like I don't want so much to be, the, you know, the negatives, you know, that I'm always this negative message, I want it to be positive too. But then I also was thinking um, that there are, um, I mean, there are people that can't, they're not in a position to meet my needs right now. And, you know, and I understand that. And you've talked, you know, um, about that, you know, some before too. You, I remember you sharing about a client that was like, I can't do that now. I, I agree to put this on the goal of, of things to work towards you know, but I'm not, you know, and then the, the partner was willing to accept that and they you yeah. know, were willing to, to do that. And I almost, I, I was thinking that that probably is applicable for this as well, because, you know, like, even if you can get an acknowledgement of, I hear what you're saying, and I can't fully do that now, but there would be hope in that. And even if, you know, if I can celebrate the, well, I see you're trying and I see that you've made progress in that, that's going to feel good to me, you know, I think, you know, as far as the relationship goes. And then I think of people that have been, um, I want to say the emotional drain, it's like no matter what I gave them, it wasn't going to be enough, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and so then there's that challenge too of, of you know, balancing my needs and my ability to, um, you know, and you kind of talked about that too with the, you know, if it's I'm always giving and, and never receiving, that's not going to feel like a, a balanced relationship too. So, um, and yeah. I think, you know, like, and, and hopefully not an affair, but even looking for, okay, if my, if this relationship can't give me everything I need, you know, how else can I, you know, plug that hole, you know, so, you know, this person can only meet me this much, this little skinny mm -hmm. piece, but I have this much I need. So, you know, who else can fill in, you know, that, that those spots. Um, so that, 
And I think even for myself, you know, it's like, um, you know, if, if I was dependent on my husband for all my social, you know, interaction and relationship, the poor guy, you know, it would be, it would be a lot. I'm, you know, I'm a lot, you know, so it's like, you know, I, I like social, I like connecting. So, so I, you know, I understand that. And he's, um, we did a personality test and it was so funny because he's so introverted and clearly I'm not, you know? And so, so I was like, yeah, no, I really do need the social interaction. So like I've had to learn to get those needs met, you know, for connection and not loneliness, you know, Mm -hmm. from outside he's always supportive of me you know going off with my hiking friends or running friends or whatever mm -hmm. too so so that feels like you know I've got the support to not be lonely even if he's not directly meeting that need so yeah yeah that along with this this comment here it reminds me of a story this this comment says I'm aware of my needs but when I try to engage I get shut down a lot of the time I would rather not put myself in a vulnerable position so I disengage emotionally um, one of my quests of the last, I'd say probably 10 years is to develop some adult friendships with men. Um, you know, friendship has not been my strong suit. I've been married to my wife for, it'll be 12 years in May. We've been together for 13 years and she is my longest standing friendship. Um, you know, friendships in high school, junior high, like those all just fell out when life circumstances changed. So I've definitely been feeling that big void. And there was a, there's a man that I, we were in our, um, our bachelor's degree together and we went to our master's program together. And um, there was a time where we were very, very close. We were both newlywed. We didn't have kids. Um, we were both in school together. There was a, there was a lot that brought us together and um, you know, short of making friendship bracelets and, and exchanging those at graduation, we, we made each other a promise that like we were going to stay connected and we were going to, we're going to help each other practice good self-care and, and be able to do the work that we do as therapists really well. Well, one thing that I was noticing over the years, he was my go-to for friendship and time together, but getting on his schedule and him getting on my schedule was very, very difficult. Um, and so, you know, one would ask and the other would, no, that's not going to work for me. What about this? And it just got to a point where, we understood and I think rightly so it wasn't this like we didn't like each other kind of thing but rightly so we weren't enough of a priority in each other's life or what it took to make each other a priority was more work than we were able or willing to give and so we still probably see each other maybe a handful of times a year and it's always a really good time and you know there's there's really great support but he's no longer the person that I go to emotionally um there's a couple of other friendships that I've been developing over the last couple of years. These guys live around the corner from me. We have common interests. It's really easy. Like just this Saturday, I, I said to my friend, I want to go on a long bike ride. Are you up for it? We mountain bike. So he took me to a place that I've never been and we had a blast. We spent, you know, two, three hours together on Saturday morning and um, it wasn't a huge wreck to each of our days. We didn't have to move massive amounts of things to get there. And that kind of relationship works. I have a It was a drop in by Dr. Rob, wasn't it? <laughs> um, I, I have another friend who it's it's the same story, but anytime I want to go for a run or anytime any of us needs help around either of us need help around the house, like I know he's available. I know it's not hard for him. He knows the same thing with me. And so um there's a lot more engagement there. And sometimes we will disengage emotionally because it's too painful and that needs to happen. Um, sometimes we get the feeling that we need to disengage because um, it's just not working. There's not enough of a, of a back and forth or what we get back is maybe disdain or resentment or, um, you know, feelings that are insurmountable for our partner when it comes to our relationship or, or their own stuff. So, you know, that definitely, I think part of, for, for me, part of what doing a strong reach does is it helps me to gauge more accurately what the information is that I'm getting back. Um, you know, so if I reach in a way where my needs are clear, I'm giving someone a very good idea of what they can do for me. And when I hear a no back from them and it's a, I would really like to do that, but I can't right now. I can trust that a lot more from them. Or when I get this, like, 
I don't want I don't want you to talk about that or or yes and then there's no follow through. That also gives me a lot clearer information because I know where I was coming from. Um, and that it, I think sometimes the reality is we're we're disengaged and lonely because that relationship is not for us. That's not where we're going to get those needs met. I was thinking when you're talking about the friend, you know, that you used to be so close with. I've had those and I've got so many friends that I, they were, were so important in my life at that season, but then the seasons mm -hmm. changed. And yeah. it's been interesting. Like you said, when we see each other, it's a great time and all that. And when I get back together with them, we fall right back into step. But for the, you know, but their lives are different, you know, um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so, you know, it, it, whether it's distance or schedules or whatever, um, it, you know, it, it, so that doesn't mean that they're not important, but I always think mm -hmm. of the levels too. It's like, okay, you know, these are the people or the, the, my inner circle is the people that I need to count on the most. I need to be most involved with and all that. And then there's the other you know, people, mm -hmm. you know, there's all these different levels. And so, so somebody that might've been in here for a while is now out here and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and if, if things happen so that we're able to reconnect, you know, uh, they move in down the block, you know, we'll be, you know, we'll be great friends again. So, um, you, but, you know, if, if they've gotten moved, I probably need to find somebody or some buddies, you know, some, you know, may be a couple of people that need to help fill that void. Cause I feel like I've got this void and mm -hmm. I need to fill it one way or the other. So it's just a matter of how that, how the puzzle pieces come together. And that's a piece that, a lot of old thinking about relationships would say that's a problem if you have a void that you need somebody else to feel. I think it's a fact of human life. Like we need each other and we need other people. Um, as easy as it would be to only have a relationship with myself, it would be completely unfulfilling. Yes. Um, you know, there's some of that navigating those voids and those differences that I think really shapes us and informs us of, of who we are and what's important to us. And it's really necessary for our, I'll even go as far to say for our survival. Um, we, we are not going to thrive without other people in our life. So that need is, there's, there's nothing pathological or wrong with that need or even recognizing that need is related to some kind of hole that I have. Um, it's just that that hole cannot be filled by just anybody or often I found that hole can't be filled by the people who I want to fill it the most. And I have to be open to... Um, I have to be open to being surprised by some relationship possibilities. Yeah. And maybe void isn't the right answer. Maybe it's a desire for attachment or whatever. I was just looking at something um, uh, and I'm going to go back and look at it this afternoon, but Dr. Rob has talked about, you know, the opposite of addiction is attachment. And, mm -hmm. and, and this was basically aligning with all of that as well. And so I, you know, I think of, you know, it is important. It is imperative for us as, you know, as humans to be, you know, connected and attached. And so, so I think that what I call the void, I think it's just that desire to be attached and engaged. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I think of older people, you know, the, it, the, the ones that stay home and just are, you know, disconnected from everything. Well, they wither away, you know, like yeah. even if they're physically still here, you know, their mi minds aren't as sharp. So I think that we, you know, we help each other, you know, by supporting each other, but by bettering each other, because, you know, even in the challenges, you know, we're helping each other, you know, grow and, and remain um, vital, I guess. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any questions? It doesn't have to be around disengagement and loneliness. Um, questions in general or around the topic is welcome too. So I'll, put out we have a couples workshop that's coming up this weekend at the seeking integrity los angeles uh, paul hartman is the facilitator and we'll be offering another one september 20th through 22nd if i've got the dates right in my nice. brain um, but we'll be offering these it's limited to only four couples but it's a really great opportunity on the uh, seekingintegrity.com website there's information about it and We'll update and put the uh, September dates on that as well. But, um, you know, for couples that are looking to 
um, better navigate the their relationships and find healthy ways to uh, deal with conflict. You know, we, we kind of talked about this last week too, but it's, you know, it's a safe place to really dig in and get some foundation, you know, for, um, for moving forward. So keep that in mind. There's lots of, lots of good stuff. And the Seeking Integrity Los Angeles is, is doing a great job of helping men you know, that have been struggling with sex addiction and intimacy disorders or the co-occurring sex addiction and chemical dependency. So I'm really, really proud of that program. So, And that, uh, that workshop is open to couples at any stage in recovery or? Yes. I, you, you know, I think there, there will be some people that are dipping their toe into recovery and see, but, but like all of a sudden, you know, you've got two people that aren't really sure how to communicate with each other and how to navigate that. Now, I think for people that have, you know, it, you know, if he or she have been through treatment and, um, you know, have made progress, then, then again, there's this gap of like, okay, you know, like, again, how do we, how do we deal with this? So, so I, yes, I think, um, you know, it's for people who have experienced betrayal. And um, uh, so it's, it will be foundational for helping them um, learn some different ways to communicate with each other. So sounds good. Yeah. Any comments, questions? Quiet group today, but we 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 appreciate you being here. So definitely. Yeah. Well, I guess if we don't have comments or questions, anything else from you? Otherwise, we'll do this again next week. No, that's it for me today. I'll be excited to be back on next week um, talking about another one of those critical areas that makes a difference in your relationships. I really do appreciate that you have practical tools. And even like when you were talking about this, I'm reflecting back on other ones, you know, where you've, where you've shared, you know, here's some ideas on how we can do this. So it's, so if you happen to just be joining um, at this point in the series, I'd invite you to look at some of the previously recorded because, you know, again, lots of practical tools for helping our relationships. Oh, so we got a question here. So, um, oh, I don't know how to re-engage when I keep getting pushed away. That's yeah. So, um, again, this, this image comes to mind and I, I don't intend this at all to make light of your situation because I know it's way more serious than playing fetch with my dog, but we have a big hill in our backyard and I love it for playing fetch because it wears her out to run down and up that hill. So I was playing with her yesterday and um, she just turned two. So she's still got a lot of puppy brain going on and, you know, she's very good at retrieving the ball and she'll bring it back. And her latest thing is to get within arm's reach. And when I reach to take the ball from her mouth, she gets just far enough away. And when I, you know, stand up again, she gets just within arm's reach and, you know, that's the game. And, for a little while, it's entertaining, um, but you know, after a while, it's like, I don't really want to chase you around the yard. I want you to chase the ball. And so um, at, at first, that's how me and my boys were engaging with her is let's get the ball. And um, more, more playfully, what I said to them is, let's see what happens when she brings the ball back and we try to reach for it and she doesn't give, what, what would happen if we kind of shifted our attention elsewhere. We had some friends over and they were playing basketball in the driveway. So, so what if we turn our back and, you know, we kind of walk and pay attention to the driveway. I said, my guess is she's going to drop the ball at our feet and we'll be able to play again. And so we do it. And, you know, after a couple seconds, they erupt in laughter because that's exactly what she did as she dropped the ball and was ready to engage again. And that image comes to mind for me because I think sometimes if we're getting the same information back again and again, re-engaging may not come from just that vulnerable place. We may need to re-engage on the reality of what's happening right now. So it may be re-engaging in a way that says, hey, I've noticed this pattern that when I try to bring genuine connection to, to me, I feel like I get shut down. I feel like that gets dismissed. Um, and that's really hurtful to me. Are you aware that that's what's going on or, or, um, you know, I want you to know that's what it feels like for me, because if you're missing some connection with me, that may be a piece of the puzzle that may be important for you to have. So, um, while I think it's important in our initial attempts to re-engage that we make those soft and we make them desirable, if the overall pattern is that's not changing things, you might need to re-engage in a way that's more direct, more focused on your needs. Um, and more to the point of, hey, this is what's happening in our relationship. 
if you're not aware, I want you to be, um, or I need to know that you're aware so that I can, I can reevaluate the information that I'm getting from you in a more accurate light. I was thinking too, if I, you know, was constantly trying and then I just quit, you know, um, I, I think sharing like you suggest, but then say, you know, um, for me, what I'd rather do with our relationship is this, where yeah. you know, we are connected and things like that. But in order for me to do that, it would, you know, I would need it back to your negotiation, it, you know, yeah. in, order to, in order for me to move to that place, you know, I would I would need to be able to come to you without being shut down and hurt. So, um, and, you know, and I, you know, I don't know. I mean, um, some people will go, don't care, you know, um, yeah. And that's sad, but true. But um, yeah. and 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 I don't, I'm not giving anybody off the hook. But you know, some people just are not capable in, in the place that they're at. You know, especially if there's active addiction, they're they just aren't able to do that. And you know, and to get to be willing. I you know, I talk to a lot of people, and one of the things, um, and I've I've shared this with a couple of people about. Um, you know, what keeps them from getting into treatment and what keeps them from getting into recovery and it's fear. And, yeah. and I, and I said, I shared um, that I remember going to treatment. It was a long time ago. I still remember it. And I was afraid that it wouldn't work. And I was afraid it would work mm -hmm. that, that I wouldn't, I d didn't know how to live without it. So, so, you know, you get caught up in this little space where there's like no good options. Um, so, you know, I understand on some level that people go the the situation that I know now, even if it's uncomfortable, at least I know it. Yeah. And what's gonna happen if I dive into something completely different, I might not be able to stand it. So uh so um if they are aware because of direct conversations and don't do anything to reconnect, what is a good way to see the situation in a positive way? Uh you're getting clear feedback. I would say that's the again remember that there's there's two, there's at least two kinds of truth that are being spoken at all times in relationship. Um, in the best case scenario, the spoken truth aligns with the behavioral truth or the observed truth. Um, that's the best case scenario. So even when, you know, your, your partner is disengaged or they're aloof and they say, yeah, I'm not feeling very warm towards you right now, or I'm not feeling a great desire to connect in our relationship. Um, that gives you something solid because you can hear what they're saying and you can look at their behavior and say, yeah, that's exactly what I'm getting. Um, but if, if, if you're seeing this again and again, the, the, if we want to look at it as the, the good and the bad of the situation, the good in the situation is you're seeing a consistent story and it seems to be a story that um, makes some sense. At least I'm willing to see this. I can have a place in me that this might exist is that there's not a desire to connect here. Um, I think the behavioral truth is a lot harder to come to terms with than the spoken truth. And oftentimes um, I think we try really, really hard to get a spoken truth that aligns with our desire, especially when the behavioral truth is really upsetting to us. That's a human, that's a, that's a, that's a human tendency. Um, so I, I would go back to that feeling of yours. What does it feel like for me to be in this relationship? And as I look at how this relationship is working, does it make sense that I would feel that way? And then maybe the positive here is that there, there is some internal compass orienting here, even if it is to a painful reality. And then I think, you know, being aware of those, how else can you fill that spot? I mean, you know, yeah. if, if this relationship isn't going to do that, then what are other areas where you can connect with people and have it be a healthy, feel good attachment? Yeah. Yeah. After, you know, back, back to my biking, when I, when my wife bought me my bike about two years ago and within a couple of weeks I had my first concussion. Um, one of the things that I have not told you this story, Tammy. I, I, I think I would remember that one. So, so I, I, I got real adventurous real quick and I, I went over my handlebars one day and I came home and my elbow was scraped up and my knee was scraped up. And I thought like, you know, that, that comes with the territory. Like I'm just going to get ready and go to work. And my wife was like, are you sure you're okay? Like you, you seem a little bit off. And I was like, I'm probably just a little shaken. It's fine. 
Well, I get to work and I'm in staff meeting and people are saying things. And I said, I know you're saying real words, but this doesn't make sense oh, to me. Wow. I think I need to go to the hospital. <laughs> so I, I called my wife and I said, um, can you come drop me off at the emergency room? <laughs> she says, drop you off. Like, why would I do that? And I was like, well, I don't want you to, I don't want you to tie up your day at the emergency room, but I need to go. And she's like, I'm not dropping you off. I'll get sitters for the kids. And she came and I had a concussion and I was like on concussion protocol for like a week and a half. And it was super miserable. But one of her first comments to me after establishing that I was okay, she said, this is why I don't want to do that kind of stuff with you. Um, she's like, it's dangerous and I'm not willing to accept that level of danger for myself. Um, you know, so we, we, we go and do adventurous things together, but when I want a real adrenaline rush, I call my buddy down the block because he's okay with that level of risk too. Um, and so, you know, to your point, Tammy, of see where maybe those other needs could be met. That's important that those needs get met. And that those needs get met um, in a way that is congruent with you and how you view what needs to happen in, in your relationships. Well, and I you think of like, you know, like I'm a lot, I'm a lot better off and I think I'm more interesting because I've got more going on with other people. If I was just, if it was just my husband and I, you know, I, a long time ago in a meeting, uh, someone said, you're a real small package if you're all wrapped up in yourself. And yeah. it took me a little while, but I finally figured out that, you know, like if, if I don't have, you know, more breadth, if I don't have more connection, you know, like I get pretty stagnant. So, it, you know, it is important for me to, um, you know, to continue to fire up my brain cells and relationship skills. So we have yeah. a question. I've watched a bit of your work on mother enmeshment. It's fascinating. My husband has carried tons of anger towards me for most of our relationship. When I met him, he said he was a very angry guy. I often feel like his anger does not at all match what I've done. Oh, I'm having a reaction to that one. Can you speak to the transfer of mother anger onto the spouse? Yeah. Um, so that's a very, very common dynamic. And, um, my, my colleague uh, and mentor around this stuff, Ken Adams, would say he's angry at the wrong woman. And that is, that's a very common dynamic that we see. When you look at where a mother enmeshed man, man comes from, um, he didn't choose the enmeshment to begin with. Um, he may choose it going forward in, in, in his life, but he didn't choose it to begin with. So there were the very adult needs um, very adult emotions of his mother or, or father or other people in the family that were placed on him at an early age. Um, what marriage and dating represents for most of us um, is the first significant relationship that we choose, that we completely choose. And with that choice comes a lot of latitude, a lot of ability. Um, so a lot of the mother and mesh men that I work with um, a lot of them get to a point where they're very, very clear on why they want to be with their spouse and why they're attracted to her and, you know, why they want to keep that relationship. Um, but they may not be clear on what parts of them emotionally get to come to the table because they've chosen into a relationship. And for a lot of mother and mesh men, it's their anger gets to come to the table. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, they're angry at the wrong woman. Um, and until they break that taboo of breaking mom's heart, betraying mom by saying, hey, I'm not okay with how this is going. I can't give that to you. I won't give that to you. That's not yours to ask. Until they betray, quote unquote betray mom in that way, they'll continue to offset anger on the nearest person who has actually, um, I think in, in most cases, has actually created some space for his feelings and validated some of his feelings. And I would say that becomes, I'm going to use this term very um, cautiously here, that becomes an abuse of that relationship. You know, when you give some empathetic latitude or some tell me more about that, that makes sense to me, he may overreach into that. Um, and his work is to figure out where that anger comes from. And it's not that every mother and mesh man that I work with has no legitimate complaints in his primary relationship. A lot of them do. Um, anyone who's in a relationship has a legitimate complaint about it. However, the willingness to rock the boat in a, a 
deliberate way, like to say, Hey, I need to share something with you and it's not going to be an easy conversation, but I feel like we need to talk about this for the good of our relationship. A lot of mother and mesh men aren't willing to rock the boat because they've been trained to just make everybody happy. Um, so his, his, his job becomes to be willing to tell the truth, even if it makes people unhappy um, because we can orient to what the truth is. And almost without fail, what I hear from the wives of the mother and mesh men that I work with is when he starts quote unquote, getting a backbone or saying like, Hey, this is how I really feel about this. Um, she'll often say, I've never been more attracted to him or felt more safe with him. However, I'm really angry that it's taken him this long to get to this point. Um, but that's, that's a big test. I think for a lot of the mother and mesh men that I, that I see is getting to that point where they're willing to say something upsetting and take a stand that may be upsetting, but true for them. Um, and that's, you know, that, that comes from, I think a lot of their work being willing to be uncomfortable in the service of getting connection. That's actually intimate. That's actually two way. Um, so as the, as the spouse in that situation, that's where I would, you know, you getting educated on that, that dynamic of mother enmeshment, I think is, is a really important key and being able to hold that space and very lovingly inviting, Hey, I think this has less to do with me and maybe more to do with your mom. I really would like you to look at that because I do want a connected relationship with you. Um, but this seems to be getting in the way. Um, and that, that loving invitation again and again is, I would say probably one of the best ways to encourage him into seeing more of the the full picture i i love that i think it's spot on and you know i think yeah definitely holding you know not not yelling back but but and i also had a you know thought too when he said when i met him he said he was a very angry guy and i was like how sad how sad that mm -hmm. he would just accept that i'm an angry guy there's so much mm -hmm. you know that and and the mother and mesh men intensive that you know that you offer is fabulous and you know could help him but even even if you just pull apart the anger you know like th there's there's so much that can be done about anger management and whatever but yeah. you know I don't, you know i mean anger is uh, well a anger is, um, I feel like a defensive, I, for, for me, um, I um, found that I could use anger, I would rather be angry than hurt, and I was hurt. And so if I was angry, that that felt like a more powerful position, because then I, I was blasting it out rather than having to deal with the hurt. So I understood that about that, that took some therapy, that took some work, you know, to, to get there and to learn to be okay with the hurt was a challenge. Mm -hmm you know? Um, mm -hmm. So, so part of me was like, okay, are, you know, I, I'm sure there's legitimate anger, but I also am thinking there's probably more um, beyond that. And I would love to have him get some, you know, help that really helps that. I was also thinking when you're talking about the partners who are going like, why did it take you so long? We, you know, that's the same for addiction. You know, this too. It's like, yeah. that's the same for addiction. It's like, okay, I mean, we've been married 20 years. You've been, you know, dealing with this and, you know, now you finally get it. And I'm happy about that. But you know, like, what about all the 20 years, you know, so, so there's, there's grieving, you know, in the loss of whatever time frame, you know, uh, and whatever relationship you'd hope for in that time frame, but, but then also the hope of what the path can look like, you know, as you go forward too. So yeah, there's some really great, I'm, I'm posting now in the chat, there's some great resources on overcoming enmeshment.com for spouses and in mesh men. Um, Dr. Adams has done a lot of videos and a lot of blog posts um, that are really good. Um, the beginning of next year, I think they're going to be launching an intensive for spouses of in mesh men. Um, uh, Dr. Adams and Wendy Conquest um, that will focus on how you hold some of that space and cope with this dynamic while your partner's healing. Um, you're also welcome. I put my email in there. You're also welcome to reach out to me um, with any specific questions you have on that. Um, I do have a workshop coming up in the Phoenix area. It'll be February 6th through the 9th um, of 2020. Um, so, you know, that that's another, somebody had asked in the chat, um, how do I get started on this process of becoming more intimate? The, the first place to get started is you have to emotionally divorce your mother. You have to feel free body, mind, and soul. And our goal there is not to become a group of mother-hating men. 
Um, far from it. I, I think it's really important to separate so that you can love in a way that's sustainable for you versus loving in a way that leaves you drained and resentful. Um, so that workshop is a very powerful way to start that, um, start that process. And, and I agree. And y y yes, and um, uh, it, 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 there is a lot of enmeshment within the community that you're talking about. Um, and uh, so, so yes, I would encourage you, invite you to uh, consider the intensive because I think you would find it, and it's scary. It's got to be, you know, like you said, emotionally divorcing your mother who's, I mean, like, oh my gosh, I can only imagine how, you know, that has to be like, oh no, how would I ever do that? But, um, you know, but the freedom and to have a healthy relationship, it doesn't mean you never talk to your mother again, it, but yeah. like it's, you show up as an adult. And then, um, uh, so someone says, even though I don't think my husband is enmeshed, it feels like he's in a he puts himself in a position of a kid trying to get away with eating a cookie, and I find myself in the parent position. It seems this dynamic is part of the beginning of his beginning to act out. And I could see that being part of the cycle. But I was also thinking, um, there's a uh, uh, there's a model, I don't even know what to call it, the Cartman drama triangle. Yeah. And I was thinking about this is when you get in a one up or one down position or two up, two down, um, but, but the, where there's a, the power is uneven. And that's true with the mother and mesh men too. It's like, the, it's an uneven balance of power in a relationship. And, and I think in a healthy relationship, we're both showing up as adults and we can be more vulnerable. And, you know, I can have you know more needs at one time and, you know, vice versa, we can support each other. But at the end of the day, we're, it's a, power neutral situation where, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have all the control over me and I don't have all the control over you and I'm not parenting and you're not, you know, I mean, so it's one of those things. And so I was thinking, you know, when this, it's like, you know, now, now I can be mad at you because you're not letting me have the cookie. So I'll show you, I'm going to go act out, you know, that, you know, it's a mission. And wrecking that, recognizing that dynamic is huge because then you can step out of that parent role. If at the very least internally, you know, this person put in there, he wants to act out. So he sees me as bad or controlling, you know, maybe you can step outside that narrative. And I know this has nothing to do with me. He's, he's some, something has brought him back to five years old and that's where he needs to be now. And it's not me that wants him there. You know, very rarely do I work with a couple where the spouse is saying, I want to be married to a little boy and I want to take care of him like a, a loving mother. Like I don't, I don't, I think there's very few emotionally sound grown women who want that. Um, and, you know, so being able to recognize that that's, that's happening and that's what you feel um, that frees up some options for you in how you want to respond. And that might be one of those places where you realize this is his bus wreck and you can take your hands off the wheel and it's okay for you to step back and let there be a tantrum because it's not about you or about anything you can do. It's something far, far earlier than that. I put in over here in the chat too, if you, if you Google Cartman drama triangle, he has a whole website dedicated to, to this and it's super fascinating um, information on what I think is the default setting for how we do conflict in relationships. Um, and it's, it's like the most unuseful way to do conflict in relationships, but it's, we all fall into it because it's so natural. Yeah, it's what we've known. So it goes back to the like the fear of change is, you know, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, it could be worse. So someone writes um, he, uh, about the partner. He's often unwilling to express his feelings other than anger because he says he, know, he knows I won't react well, yet he's never given me a chance. Instead, he tells me how I'll be probably how his mom was. And that's kind of a question mark. So um, if, if I were in your shoes, I'd want to say something like, I'd really like to be given the chance to react, even if it's going to fall in line with your worst fears. I want it to be my reaction because I have a right to that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's again with a lot of the mother and mesh men that I work with. One of the things I work with them on, on kind of this spine stiffening or getting some sharp edges is you're going to need to tolerate. He likes lights, lights are his favorite thing. You're going to need to be able to tolerate um, people being upset with you. You're going to need to be able to tolerate a genuine emotional reaction um, from your from your partner or spouse or from your boss, um, because that's real information about where they're at. And if you want a relationship that is going to work, you have to know 
where they're actually at. You can't live in a fantasy or you can't prop up a fantasy of, of where you're most comfortable with them. Um, and there's, there, there's some real growing that has to happen there. But first it comes with that willingness of, can you take your partner on your partner's terms? Can you allow yourself to be surprised by your partner? Um, I, I've done a, a lot of work with couples where there's been mother enmeshment and by and large, when she, when she shows uh, compassion and softness and understanding, he's often very shocked. Um, and often he'll miss that first reach. Um, but it's so, so key for him to let his partner have her reaction because he can recalibrate um, to something new. Otherwise, he is just going off that narrative that mom laid down. And this is how all women are around this. And he never gets challenged and, and it never gets better. So my new note to myself is make sure I finish whatever podcast I'm listening to as soon as my phone rings. So I'll tell you which one I was listening to. There's one on ADHD and relationships and addiction with Dr. Todd Love. Fascinating. Oh, yeah, yeah it's great. really good. So, uh, so um, it's on sex, love, and addiction. So if you go to sexandrelationshiphealing.com, um, I clicked on iTunes and I was listening to it. But like I said, no to, so I apologize to the group and no to self. I have to close those out because it immediately turns it back on as soon as my phone rings. So, but, but if you, you know, that one just dropped uh, last Thursday. So um, uh, we're up to 60 episodes of that already. It's like fast. Yeah, that's, it's really, it's good stuff. But um, yeah, I have like five more minutes of that one to listen to. And I was, oh my gosh, it's so good. So anyway, so, but I apologize. So any other questions or comments from, from the group? Great questions. Thank you so much for yeah, it's been good questions. asking good stuff. So, and then the garbage truck is here. So my dog is, this, <laughs> I called, this is like chaos, chaos in my craziness. So, <sighs> We're, we're all, I'm always happy to roll with it, Tammy. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> and it's recorded, so everybody gets to see. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Okay, so um, Dr. Rob will be on for his live, uh, web, his live Q&A webinar tonight at 5 p.m. Pacific time, so join us uh, for that. And, oops, we got another question. So, um, Is self-care selfishness? No, no, no. Go ahead and answer that one. No, I would, I would say I... I I actually love engaging around those narratives of self-care or selfishness because um, often that comes from this. I'm supposed to put others before myself and all of those are really great ideals. But the the thing that's, that's prevalent in all of those I ideals is there has to be a self first that we can choose to put something before. And if to me, what self-care is, is it's really cultivating my deep understanding of myself. So then I can appropriately place myself in my relationships and there's times where I need to put myself at the front of the line. And there's times I need to put myself in the back of the line and um, you know, that, that kind of stuff. But you can't, you can't determine that accurately and usefully if you don't have a cultivated self. So that's what your self care is, is that time to really get to know you. Um, and I actually think that's a gift to everyone in a relationship with you. Because if you really get to know you and you find out that you are this cranky, curmudgeon person that doesn't like people, at least you can be forthright about that. And you don't have to give people any other impression. Um, so it's, it's definitely, um, it's needed for yourself and it's needed for the people that you're in a relationship with. So in my book, any way you slice it, self-care is a must. There's no reason that there's no relational reason not to engage in it. Well, and I like if 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 I'm if the tank is drained, there's nothing left for me to give to anybody. I'm you know if, at some point if I'm not doing things that replenish me, um, and it, and I don't view that as selfish. I view that as that lets me then do the things that I do want to do that are you know helpful for others. I'm in recovery. If I didn't take care of my own recovery program, you know, I pray I wouldn't be relapsing. But you know, like I. I'm sure I'd be far more vulnerable, you know, mm -hmm. than I would be. And, you know, and we always talk about that in recovery. It's like, you know, if you're doing outreach for others, um, it benefits your recovery. So it's, it is self-care on some level, but the people that I've seen um, and therapists, um, you know, can be very vulnerable to this. If they're not mm -hmm. taking care of their own program, they're the ones that get in trouble. They relapse and yeah. then they 
you know, licensing issues and all of this other stuff. And I always go back to, you got to take care of your own self and your own program and whatever first, you know? So, so it, it is, uh, can be people be selfish in self care? Probably. I mean, people can take anything to an extreme, but, um, you know, I, 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 I I, I have a feeling that you'd have to go a really long ways to tip the scale into that area. <laughs> so, no. okay. All right. Well, now we are about out of time. So um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the great questions and comments. So helpful. And as always, John, thank you for your time and I'll look forward to next week and the message again. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.